get lit up before Brother Knox comes here. Uh, John chapter 7. Oh, street ministry as well, uh, 10 a.m., corner of Walden and Union. Nice turnout for a number of weeks in a row. We had 11 people there yesterday preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was only told I'm number one once. <laughs> Too bad. Most of the people just gave me a Queen Mary wave, you know, but that's good. Those are what we like. We don't like the, the your number one salutes. Uh, John chapter 7, we're going to deal with verses 37 through 53. Close out the chapter today. Okay, so last week we uh, looked at uh, what I call the, the temple chatter. Conversation of, around, about the person of Jesus Christ. Um, misunderstood, of course. Everyone's got an opinion about Jesus, may or may not be correct, right? We'll take a look at that a little more this morning. Um, but we'll see uh, also here added into the mix of things a little end times prophecy uh, and a little social commentary if you can handle that from me this morning. So we'll just let the word of the Lord speak to us in a number of different ways. The message is called A House Divided uh, because Jesus came to bring division in his first coming. And we're just going to have to understand that about Jesus, and we've watched it live out in our lives. So let's, let's just pray, and then we'll begin to read the verses and break them down and, and uh, see what the Lord has for us. Father, just want to thank you, Lord. This day has been already, it's been a blessing to me. Um, this good time in prayer, good time enjoying the, the, the beauty of your creation, Lord. Um, thinking how great thou art as I just sat and stared off my front porch, Lord. Um, just so far, so good. Time already fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ, singing your praises. We're now going to study your book. And the day is young, and we have this all day. And while our physical bodies may tire out, Lord, uh, I pray that all of us would have renewed inner man, renewed spirits within us. And that it would uh, just stir up uh, love for you, love for one another, and uh, a zeal and a passion uh, to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who so desperately need it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, verses 37, 38, and 39. We're going to pick back up. Jesus is preaching in the temple. Actually, let's start in verse 32, but we'll comment on 37 through 39. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am thither ye cannot come. So Jesus is already excluding the religious Pharisees from entrance into the kingdom of God. He says, You're going to be looking for me. Of course, that's a prophetic reference to the fact that they'd be looking for a dead body that they were hoping to put out on display so that people wouldn't think he actually rose from the dead. They didn't find one. Because Jesus is alive forevermore. Took that body, came right up out of that grave. He sits at the right hand of the Father. You will never find Jesus' body buried anywhere on this planet. Amen. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go? that we shall not find him. Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am thither ye cannot come? Always, religious people, they just, they just don't understand the book. Because they're thinking with goggles of religion. What did my priest tell me? What did my pope tell me? What did my pastor tell me? What did, what did the elder of the church tell me? What did the deacon tell me? Instead of what did the word of God tell me? That, and that's just, that's, it's just nature. It's human nature. We need to break that nature and let the Bible teach us and, and, and give us good doctrine. Amen? In the last day, that great day of the feast, here's where we're going to start for today. Uh, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, 
which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And we see that from these verses that Jesus often, he would preach something that would stand as a type of something else. So come on, I'm, I can give you water. I can quench your thirst. What was he referring to according to the scripture? The giving of the Holy Ghost. But the, the religious people, they didn't get that. They didn't understand any of it. To them, what is he talking about, water? A cup of water? Oh, you mean so if a priest blesses this and gives us to drink, then we'll... No. But that's religion. Amen? That's just the way it is. So as was the case with verse 28 from last week, Jesus, he's, at, he's um, at the end of the feast, he simply stands up and he begins to what? Preach. You know, a thing that isn't done much anymore. And what's his message? What, come on, what is, every time Jesus got up, got up and preached, unless he was condemning a Pharisee, what did he preach? Come unto me. Drink. Be refreshed by me. Newness of spirit, I offer you a gift. Ye must be born again. Believe on me and live. The gift of eternal life uh, in God's work on the cross. Uh, just that, that faith, that faith in what the Lord did. What the Lord did, not what you did. What's, what, what do you get from just faith in Jesus? Foreverness. Eternal life. So let's run a few verses and I want to make a point. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because Jesus stands up. He's got an audience. He doesn't care about what people are thinking about him. He stands up and he begins to preach. And he preaches him. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23. But we, church, that's us, we. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block. And under the Greeks, foolishness. No, preacher, you don't understand. When you get out there, you've got to just rail out. You've got to get on their sins. Get on their sins. No, I've got to do that in the church house. Show my people their sins. They're not his people. You're his people. So I've got to reveal your sin and mine. It's a fun job. I know somebody's got to do it, right? Uh, but out there, what do we do? We preach Christ crucified. If you don't preach, well, then you're not preaching anything, right? Just kind of existing, just existing as a Christian, as a silent minority. And if you do preach, my question then becomes, what do you preach? Now listen, I'm addressing pastors here, I'm addressing street preachers, I'm addressing anybody that lifts, lifts up their voice and talks to people about the Lord. But pastors in particular, you got a pulpit, man. What do you preach? Maybe I should have saved this for, you know, when we get all the pastors here tonight, but it's not my job. We'll, we'll turn that over to Brother James today. But what do you preach? Look at 2 Corinthians. We're close. 2 Corinthians 4. We'll run a few verses here. Try to make a point. Right? For out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5 For we preach not ourselves, not our church, not our name, not our denomination, not our congregation. We're not talking, you're not preaching me. Any pastor stands at a pulpit, preaches about his church or about himself. No, you don't want to have anything to do with that. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves servants for, your, for Jesus' sake. How about that? What if, what if pastors had that mentality? I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to preach about him. And if I'm going to reference me, it's going to be me as a servant to him for, or servant to you for his sake. That doesn't go with the normal narrative now, does it? Listen, I'm all for a well-placed, needful illustration, pastor's personal experience. The more personal, the better. Because then you can get a little piece of his life and maybe it'll affect you somehow, some way. 
But I don't want to hear an entire message about the preacher. A little Jesus and a little Bible tossed in for good measure. I don't want to hear a message about the church he pastors. With a little Bible and a little Jesus tossed in for good measure. Jesus never once preached about running to the church for refuge. If he did, you show me. Or seeking out a good preacher, though it's good to have one. Preachers, what do you preach? It's got to be Jesus. Amen. It's pointless. If this isn't about Jesus, close up the book, go home, watch television, eat, drink, and be merry. You waste everyone's time if this isn't about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Romans 10. Go ahead and flip over there. Verse 8. But what saith it? Referring to the, the Word of God. The Word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the Word of faith, which we what? There's the subject matter of the preaching of the apostles. What is that? The Word of faith. Okay, well, define that for me. Okay, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. No reference to the church. No reference to the mass. No reference to confession to priests. It's not there. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession. Oh, see, confession. No, confession of that Jesus Christ is Lord. You're going to hear. Just finish the, finish the whole thing up. Mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's your confession. Jesus Christ is Lord. He died for my sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. This is my story. This is my song. So there's your message in this dispensation. Pastors, street preachers, teachers of the Word of God, evangelists alike. That's not to say that every message from every pulpit has to be a gospel or salvation message. But listen, the cause is Christ. The aim is His glory. The purpose is the salvation of souls, as is His will. That's the point. All right, one last turn for the moment. Galatians chapter 1. I hope you guys got some more life tonight, man. I have to just jump around screaming for everybody tonight. Verse 6, Galatians 1, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I, I'm shot, I'm stunned, I marvel, the Holy Spirit says through Paul, that you would go from the importance of the grace of God in the matter of salvation to something totally different. Which is not another gospel, or what which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, yeah, then we're talking, of course, contextually here, you're talking about people who would come in and try to subvert the gospel of Jesus Christ. They add works, which is what Galatians was all about, adding the works of the law. But I mean, listen, the gospel of Jesus Christ can be perverted by saved people. So what do you mean by that? By not talking about it, but by talking about other things of unimportance. Think on the lovely things. Verse 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached uh, unto you, let him be accursed. 
As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. I'll tell you what. I marvel that so many of my brothers and sisters have turned aside as they have preaching the gospel of Trump. You can vote for him all you want. I don't care. I'm going to probably end up voting for him just because Hillary makes me want to hurt myself. But, yeah, thank you. I needed that. But preaching the gospel of Trump, preaching the gospel of Whole Foods, not that I'm against Whole Foods. Whole Foods are good for you. Preaching the gospel of flat earths, which has been a movement in our days. You don't get it. Instead of preaching Christ crucified, you, you, have, you have Facebook. It's your pulpit. All day long, we get to see what you ate. Where you went, where are you planning to go? And everything in between. Where's the gospel? Why am I why am I seeing a picture of a flat earth on a Facebook post demanding all Christians wake up? And do what? Throw it like a frisbee? What am I supposed to do if it is flat? Who cares? Preach Christ. Preach Christ. Needful to be aware of other things and other surroundings. Whole Foods, again, good for you. Flat Earth's pointless. Trump? Debate's still out. But we know what is needful is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So even Jesus preached. Jesus. Sounds pretty arrogant to me. Well, I think God, the Creator, has every right to preach Himself. Now, look at the first four words of verse 37. Back in John. What are the first four words? In the last day. That is no coincidence. In the last day, Jesus follows up with a message on being born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine, justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. The crux of his message, in the last day, he stood up and preached that. Listen to me. There is a difference between the Spirit, capital S, in the last day and the Spirit, little s, of the last day. God's Spirit in the last day is still in operation. Less and less, because Christians are less and less willing to let the Spirit of God move through them, but He is still in operation. And His message in two thousand years has not changed. The church's messages continue to change. Right? From purpose driven this to every day's a Friday that. But the Holy Spirit's message has not changed. In two thousand years it is still Christ crucified. It is still Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8. Now listen, you can go around sign after sign after sign on churches all over the place. And they love to put up Hebrews 13.8, which is what I just quoted for you. And they always put up, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 2,000 and a, let's say, 20, 2,200 years ago, Jesus Christ was not manifest in the flesh. Jesus was not born. He was not the same 2,200 years ago. So I don't understand. What are you trying to do? Is this, are you being blasphemous? I'm not. I'm helping you understand the verse. The verse before that, verse 7, Hebrews 13, 7, says, it starts talking about the end of the conversation. 
What conversation? Jesus Christ. The same conversation was yesterday. The same conversation needs to be today, and that conversation will go on throughout eternity. We're not going to stop talking about Jesus. It always will be. So if you don't like that, it's never going to change, church. you got to change. Amen. So let's get, let's get on track, church. Come on, let's get on track. The end is nigh. The gospel's got to be preached. If there's a hundred souls left out there, and that's all that's left in the world, a hundred souls, and we got one of them in western New York, let it not be said that we did nothing to try to win them. Let's not just let that banner that hangs over the doors, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Let it not just be a song we sing. How are we feeling? All right? We're okay, right? All right, good. Thank you. Verses 40 through 44. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. And others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was so there was division among the people because of him and some of them would have taken him but no man laid hands on him so we considered this from last week that there are some things that people believe about Jesus Christ that you simply cannot find in the scripture right people debate about Jesus all the time this is what you got you got people debating about who they thought Jesus was and none of them, you don't hear any of them say, well, why don't we refer to the scriptures? Let's see what the Bible says. You know, they reference the scripture, but you don't see them turning there. So there's things that people believe about Jesus you couldn't find in the scripture with a magnifying glass and the Holy Ghost whispering over your ear. Look at this, look at it. You couldn't find it because it's not there. And then there are things people refuse to believe about Jesus Christ that can be found all over the scripture. Debating who Jesus was, is, and will be is as common now 2,000 years later as it was 2,000 years ago. It's just man. Part of the division you see in these verses, right? There's division among the people, verse 43. Some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Part of this division is not only whether or not we should accept Jesus Christ, one group, but whether or not we should kill him. It's right there in the text. Group number two. Thus it is with man. Religious man in particular, like his father the devil, he's a murderer from the beginning without a gun and without a Second Amendment to back him. And I'm pro-Second Amendment. I'm thankful I get the right to protect my family. Praise the Lord. But, you know, the problem is not the weapon. Guy didn't have a... He didn't have a gun in Nice, France. He had a truck. But he had murder in his heart. Problem is not the weapon. Problem is the heart. Man is so far removed from his maker, he calls the, the good things of this life evil, and the evil things he calls good. He's flipped upside down. Man has gone crazy because he's forgotten his maker. Now we'll get more into man's true father in chapter 8, so we'll let that go for now. Let's uh, note in verse 43 for today. So there was division among the people because of him. Division. Because of him. Because of Jesus. Now, Luke chapter 12. Go ahead and flip over there. Verse 49, Luke 12, 49. 
Let your fingers do some walking. Amen? Learn where books of the Bible are. Verse 49, I, I am come to send fire on earth, Jesus says. But there's one of the things that people refuse to believe about Jesus that are right there in the Bible. I am going to light this place up, man. That's what he said. I am come to send fire on earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? He said, you, guys, you guys are kindling, man. You guys are, you've set the kindling in place. I'm just coming to first light up the inner man, the soul of man. Here I am 2,000 years later. I'm lit up. I want to stay lit up. But that's not what he's referring to here. He's talking about his judgment. Now there will never be a flood of waters as judgment upon this earth again. The Lord promised. And when he made that promise, he set a bow in the sky. Now... It's not his fault if a group of people want to steal that symbol and use it for something wicked. But I promise you, when he returns, he's taken his symbol back. But this earth, this earth, it's going to be baptized. Not by water. It's going to be baptized by fire. Something Jesus taught, people don't know, nor would they like to know about it if, if you revealed it to them. Verse 50. But I have a baptism, he says, but something's going to happen first. I have a baptism to be baptized with. And we're not referring to when John baptized him in the Jordan because that's already passed. And how I, am, or how am I straightened till it be accomplished? I'm in agony over this thing. So the earth is going to go through the heat of God's judgment just as Jesus was about to go through the heat of the Father's judgment upon sin which was upon him. Jesus was about to experience the baptism of death. That's the baptism to which he's referring. Verse 51, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you, nay, but rather what? Division. This earth is about to be lit up, he says. It's kindled. It's ready. He said that 2,000 years ago. How much more now? It's ready. But I have to do this thing first. I have to die for the sins of the world. It's tearing me up inside because I have to bear your sin on my body and be estranged from the Father in the process. Right? It would tear you up if you were holy. Straightened until it be accomplished. And then he says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. So... You guys are going to be lit up. I am about to die for the sins of the world. Gospel is going to be available to everybody. Everyone can be saved. But, but, once that gospel, once this task is accomplished, do you suppose that it's going to bring peace on earth? Nay. Rather division. For from henceforth, there shall be five in one house divided. Three against two, two against three. The Father shall be divided against the Son, and the Son against the Father, the Mother against the Daughter, and the Daughter against the Mother, the Mother-in-Law against her uh, Daughter-in-Law, and the Daughter-in-Law against her Mother-in-Law. And if this didn't come to pass, I know nothing about Scripture or anything else. I'm going to close the book go home. Anyone here born again? Anyone here have family that's not? Anyone here ever had a little division because of it? Now listen, division isn't always wrong. He set this thing so. You know, I know you hear that, oh, it's divisive, as if that's a bad thing. When um, I candidated at another church some time ago, they wanted to know, you know what I believed about the Bible, and I told them that I believe that the King James Bible is the only preserved word of God, that the others have been corrupted. That they're the Alexandrian text as opposed to the Antiochian text. I did it in you know, um, as much humility at the time as I, as I knew. Um, and they said that um, they don't want a pastor who's divisive over the Word of God. Okay. Listen, it is good to be divisive over the truth. Jesus is the truth. His Word is truth. And if someone's going to divide from me because of the truth, let him go. 
Now, if they're going to divide from me because of the way I presented the truth, well, then that's on me. Right? That's on me. But if they divide for the truth's sake, that's on them. Who is on the Lord's side? We sing that song, right? Who is on the Lord's side? The Lord asked that question. Moses, through the person of Moses, who is on the Lord's side? So what, what is that? The Lord drawing a line in the sand, standing right there and saying, who's with me? Well, that's divisive. That's your God. It's who he is. And Jesus backed up the Father when he said, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So he says, Listen, you can be on my side or you cannot be on my side. If you're on my side, you're with me. You're with me. All is well. I'll take care of you. If you're not, if you're on the other side, you're going to be scattered. Judgment's coming. So divisive, so exclusive. That's my Jesus. That's the Jesus of the Bible. Amen. You can accept who Jesus was. He's still willing to save your soul. You just got to stand with him. Stand with him. He's the lover of your soul. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He, want, he is ready to save you, the scripture says. He seeks to justify you, the scripture says. So what's the problem? Run to him. Stand on his side. Now watch, verses 45 and 46. Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? And the officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Okay, so what are, they, what are, the, what are the priests saying? What are the chief priests saying? They're saying, we wanted him dead. Why didn't you bring him here? Right? That's what they're saying. And the, and, and the officers, the, uh, the officers of the chief priests, they said, well, sir, you don't understand. You, you got to hear this guy talk. Wow. Did the Pharisees ever hear Jesus talk? Lots of times. One group heard him talk, and wanted him dead for his speech. The other group heard him talk and wanted to save his life despite hearing the speech. Again, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Same man, same word. Two completely and utterly opposing reactions thereto. It's about your heart. How you respond to what the Lord said. That's about you. Same man. Yesterday, today, and forever. Just sarcastically saying that for how we use it. But let me ask you this morning. Do you love, do you love him for his word? Right? I mean, so not just, not just I love him because he saved me from hellfire. Do you really love him because of what he gave you here? Like, oh, I just love this. I love it so much. Lord, I'm so appreciative of this book. Thank you so much. Thank you for your truth. If you want to know, the proof will be in how you read. How often you read. And when you do read, if it's just to go ch -ch and notch it off and go, I never get anything out of that. I don't know. I just do it. I do it because I know I'm supposed to. I don't ever get anything. That's a heart condition. That's a heart condition. It's not that the Word of God is too difficult for you to understand. It's that your ears are closed to it. If you start appreciating what you do understand about the Bible, I promise you He'll reveal more. Praise him for it. Praise him for his word. Go home today. Praise him for the truth, for the fact that someone in this wide world of ours is willing to give you a little truth. Praise him for it. You're getting lies everywhere else, man. At every turn. You got a liar running for president. 
probably going to get in too. Doesn't even matter. People don't care anymore. Not me. I want the truth. I care about the truth. And, I, and I'll praise him for it. Verses 47, 48, and 49. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. All right, so let's, let's comment on verses 47 and 48 first before we move on. I think what you're seeing here is ego-driven religious leadership. And they assume that if they don't believe it, it can't be true. And that if they do believe it, it must be true. It's just that's ego. Consider, and, and I'm bringing this up because I want you to consider what they said. Would, it says, why would you, they're basically saying, why would you believe what we don't believe. That's what they're saying. Look at verse 48. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? That's what they're asking the officers. Why would you believe what we're not believing? Follow, our, follow us. This doesn't matter who's saying what. Your priest, your pope, your pastor, a deacon, if he's saying something opposite of the Word of God, side with the Word of God. And don't worry if he's going to kick you out of his church, out of his uh, presbytery, out of the parish. You don't want to perish anyhow. Let him kick you out of the parish. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. I know it's spelled differently, but it's an interesting play on words, is it not? When you call your church a parish and God doesn't want any to perish, there's something there I'm telling you. And, and, if, and if your pastor, your priest, your pope, whatever, if he gets angry when you point out the Word of God, well, then that should tell you something right there. You don't want to follow that. Scripture says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 and 20. Doesn't say it's because there's some light in them, but they're just a little confused. If they're going to contradict this book purposefully so, not accidentally, purposefully so, it's because there is no light in them. Don't trust anything they say. Now, Let's comment on verse 49. But this people, who knoweth not the law, are cursed. This spake the chief priests about the people who gladly heard the word of the Lord. But it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. They think they're throwing a jab at the officers and at the lay people who were intrigued to listen to Jesus. You know, never a man spake as this man. I want to hear this guy. And, and, and they just say, you don't even know the law. You guys are cursed. But really, prophetically, this is about them. Want proof? All right, skip down to verses 50. Uh, skip verses 50 and 51. Go to verse 52. They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Okay. Here are the law-knowing, law-abiding chief priests rebuking the lay people for being ignorant of the word of God. And then saying, No prophet arises out of, out of Galilee. Now, go to 2 Kings chapter 14. We okay? You're on pace? We see everything? So far so good? All right, now watch 2 Kings. Do you understand the chief priests are mocking, they're ridiculing, they say, you don't know anything about the Bible. You're cursed. 2 Kings 14, verse 25. 
All right, it says, uh, He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath under the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah. Right? We know the book Jonah, right? Jonah and the fish, Jonah and the whale. The son of Amittai, the prophet, okay, a prophet, Jonah, which was of gath Hefer. Okay, that means what? I don't know. Let me give you a... Let me give you an idea of what it means. Right here, there's the Sea of Galilee. Okay? Right here is the tribe of Zebulun. That's how it broke down. Okay? In that tribe of Zebulun is a city known as gath Hefer. It is just southeast of Sepphoris just northeast of Nazareth in Galilee. That's where it is, right there. This is where Jesus grew up. You, you know he went to Chorazin. He visited Bethsaida, Capernaum. You know he's Jesus of Nazareth. Just north, if Nazareth is in Galilee, just north of it is gath Hefer, of which Jonah is a part of. You know, the prophet. Now watch this. Go to Matthew chapter 12. I think this, the Pharisees had a little more studying to do. You've got to watch who you curse before that curse comes falling back on your own head. By the way, it'll be the same group that says of Jesus, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Cursed. Matthew 12, verses 39 through 41, when Jesus is questioned about doing more miracles, he says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Well, that pretty much destroys the charismatic movement. It does. Oh, we want to see signs and wonders, signs and wonders. Yeah, that's an evil and adulterous generation seeking that. Anyhow, let's move on. Those are the words of Jesus. Those aren't my words. And there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet, the what? Prophet. Jonas. That's Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. From, by the way, the same area. Isn't that interesting? Jesus just south of gath Hefer. So the only sign Jesus was willing to give the unbelieving chief priests and the Pharisees was the sign of Jonah. Which is what? A man who died, whose carcass laid in a whale's tomb for three days and three nights. He went right down into hell, according to Scripture. And then three days and three nights later, God spit him out, resurrected him. A prophet they all knew. Pharisees knew. Sadducees knew. Chief priests knew of Jonah. Who came from where? Galilee. Now again, let me remind you of, this, of their words. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Wow. They just prophesied of themselves and they didn't even know it. Come on, listen. I'm going to tell you something about this book. It's a living book. All this stuff is in the book. Jesus uses the prophet Jonah, the one prophet that they set up. When they referenced, there's no prophet comes out of Galilee. They forgot Jonah, of which, Jesus, of, of which Jonah was a type of Jesus. They're just walking around like this. Why? Not because Scripture isn't available to them, but because they don't want to see it. The devil knows this book. 
better than any one of you in this room, better than me. He knows it better than anyone on this planet. What's the difference? Why doesn't, why doesn't he follow it? Because he doesn't believe it. Why would the devil, when you read the end of Revelation, why would the devil even bother to fight? It's like, it's like my son, when he comes at me and wants to, wants to fight and starts throwing punches, I just put my hand on his head as he's swinging. It's, just, it's a joke. You got no chance. You might take a couple of shots at me and it might hurt, but you got no chance at winning. But he thinks he does. Why? Pride. That's Satan. Back to John. We're almost done. See some eyes glazing over. Bellies rumbling. Verses 50 and 51. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth. All right, so we... Um, we're, yeah, okay. So here we have, finally, someone, a Pharisee, finally a Pharisee, a religious someone who's got a little bit of discernment, he's got a little bit of wisdom, he's reasoning, and he appears to be the only reasonable Pharisee in the group. Judgment before consideration comes from a hasty spirit. Let me say that again. Judgment before consideration comes from a hasty spirit. He that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Proverbs 14 and verse 29. Now, I told you there'd be a little bit of social commentary this morning and, and I'm going to keep my word. America's media and America's president exemplify, and I'll be careful because I don't want to curse the leader of our people, but America's president, America's media, they exemplify the term hasty of spirit. One would almost begin to start thinking that their very purpose, both the president and the media, is to exalt folly in this land of ours. If it meets the criteria, the accepted criteria, the accepted message of the day that they wish to send, whether it's got proof or with proof, without proof, they will run in haste to a conclusion and exalt the folly thereof. Even if it puts lives in jeopardy, I don't know, like police officers. Even if it exacerbates an already tense situation. Even if it divides a nation further into an impending civil war, the likes of which we haven't seen since pre-civil war. Their story, true or false, matters very little is prostituted on every television, on every newsstand, on every billboard out there until an ignorant populace believes the rhetoric. Our nation has become a nation of people who judge before we hear the whole story. Every nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. And you are watching that hell spill out onto our streets. Look at Dallas. So let me remind you of some scripture here before we disappear today. Go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6. The earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. This is just before the Lord, of course, sent the flood. He takes a look at the landscape of humanity at the time, which was many, many years ago. And he saw that, that violence filled the earth. I wonder what he's seeing now. Is it any different? And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So even the creation began, began to be corrupted because man was corrupted. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh 
is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So I'm going to, I'm going to remake this earth, I'm going to plow it, I'm going to rework the whole thing, and I'm going to destroy man with it. That's what he said. So just before judgment falls upon the earth, the people were given over to violence. Selfishness, lust of their flesh. And God spoke to one man who found grace in his sight. And he said, build an ark. Okay, look at Luke 17. Now we know that this ark is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. That if you want uh, to escape judgment, you need to get in Christ. That is the ark that will save you from the fire that is about to be kindled on this planet. See, I didn't know we heard stuff like this in church. Well, this is a Bible-believing church. So, we believe all of it. Luke 17, verse 26. Jesus offers a little prophetic warning. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. What does that refer to? Anyone know? Go ahead, shout it out. What is the day of the What is the days of the Son of Man? Second coming, his return. They did eat, referring back to Genesis. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage. In other words, they lived life unawares of anything. Everything was just the way life is. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. And here we are, church, close to the end. I really believe that. Close to the end. I wholeheartedly believe it. And wouldn't you know it? So, okay, so when you think days of Noah, what do you think? Violence, uh, fornication, rampant. Uh, people didn't care about God. They weren't interested in, in them all. I mean, that's all here today, right? Is it not? But did you ever think that a man would also do this? Do you know what that is? This just opened July. This is Brother Ken Ham built a life size Noah's Ark that is open to the public at the Creation Museum in Kentucky. It just opened in July. Everything is to the exact spec. Not because God told him to do so, that the water is flooding or anything. He didn't hear the voice of God. He just said, I really have it in me to build this thing and let people know that that lie of evolution is a bunch of it's a bunk. It's bunk. I want to show you what really happened to this earth. You want to know what happened to the dinosaurs? A flood. They lived with man. Oh, I can't believe that. That's the silliest thing I ever heard of. Really? So there's cave drawings that are found that have been excavated of dinosaurs. Now we, intelligent, educated, of course, eight, in the 1800s, we discovered dinosaurs by digging into the fossils, and of course, they you know, got that name dinosaur at the time. How is it that thousands of years ago, they were drawing pictures of them on their cave walls? What would you naturally conclude? They saw them. I can guarantee you this, they didn't dig up bones and put them together and use all the technology that we have and go, I think this is what they looked like. No, that's, that's the pseudoscience you see on Time Magazine. They saw them and drew them. You find them on rocks, you find them on walls. Look it up sometime, Google it. Archaeological evidence or cave drawings of dinosaurs. You will see them over and over and over again. There's lots of examples of them. Why aren't those in the science magazines? So here we are, man so smart, so educated in these last days, laughing off who God is, 
There ain't no Jesus going to come from the sky, as John Lennon once sang. This is a joke. Prophet uh, Peter talks about that they would mock the Lord's return in the last day. Here you are, folks. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so it is with the son coming of the Son of Man. Yes, violence fills the earth. Yes, we're given over to the fornication and the lusts of our flesh. But yes, an ark got built. And that isn't even photoshopped. That was then taking a picture with the sunset in the background. The only thing that's missing is a bow. It's because it's been stolen. Now, I don't know if that means anything. I'm not setting any dates. But this has me so stirred up that it's, it's changed the way I preach. Uh, it's, it's changed my desire to want to get out more and to preach more. It's made me more vocal because I think time is short. And I don't have a scripture verse for it, and Ken Ham didn't have a scripture verse telling them to, to build an ark. But here you are, as in the days of Noah. And by the way, you say, well, it took, you know, it took 100 years to build the ark, and so, you know, there's 100 years that we got before the Lord returns. No, that was 100 years to build it. It's built. Once it was built, Noah got in, shut the doors, and judgment came. It's built. So you do with that what you will. Here's what I want to end with. We covered verse 52. Look at verse 53. And this is what we're going to end with. Talking about Jesus, throwing things around. What is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Is he a prophet? Came out of Nazareth? I don't know. No, no, no prophet out of Galilee. I'm not sure what to make out of this guy. Verse 53, and every man went unto his own house. Which means what? Every man that was part of this conversation, individually now, heads back home. Thinking about Jesus as his whole own human spirit dictates. One has to wonder if anyone at all is listening to the call of the Holy Spirit in this whole conversation. You too. I don't know where you stand with the Lord. I don't know if you're born again. I don't know if you're saved or not. But you're going to walk home today. You're gonna, every man's going to go back to their house. We're going to drive home, not walk home. You're going to head back home, and you are going to think about Jesus either according to the Word of God or you're going to think about Him according to the dictates of your own human spirit. Which is it? What will you do with Jesus? Time is short. Ye must be born again to see the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. He did not say you must be Catholic. You must, he didn't say you must be Baptist like we got on... Well, do we even have it on the sign? We don't have it on the sign. We're a Baptist church. You don't have to be Baptist. You don't have to be a Catholic. You don't have to be a Lutheran. You don't have to be a Presbyterian. What you must be is born again. That's what Jesus said. And that's the word which we preach, which we need to continue to preach, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, and that if you'll put faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll give you a born-again spirit. He'll save you from the judgment to come. You won't know one of these days of judgment. You will not go through tribulation. You'll get zapped right out of here through the blast of a trumpet. And you'll go be with the Lord forever. Who wouldn't want that? So choose you this day. Choose life. Choose Jesus Christ. All right. Well, Scott's all loud back there. You want to pray for pray for us?